So once again, welcome to the uh, Presbyterian Peace Fellowship webinar. My name is Shannon Vance Ocampo. I serve as one of the co-moderators of the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship along with Eric Clark. And this is our first uh, webinar that we're going to be doing in 2017 for the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship. Uh, we decided at our activist council meeting and executive uh, board meeting uh, last month that what we would do is do some webinars uh, during 2017 to highlight different areas of work and to build some momentum around some of the projects and ministries of the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship. And at the end of the slideshow, we're gonna um, lay out what all of the webinars are and the timings for them. Um, this is an outgrowth of our activist council, which is um, one of the pieces of um, the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship to help us uh, reach out further into the church and to invite everyone to join in the work um, for the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship. So once again, I'm Shannon Vance Ocampo. I serve as the Transitional Presbytery Leader for Albany Presbytery, which is in the Synod of the Northeast. And, um, and I've also been involved with the Columbia Accompaniment Program over the years and other projects with the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship, including our work at the General Assembly. And now I'll let Eric introduce himself. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Eric Clark. For those of you who haven't met me, I'm a Presbyterian minister uh, living and serving out in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I am also uh, running a YouTube channel and doing a lot of different uh, activism and organizing things. Uh, one of my most exciting things I'm working on right now is a Just Energy Transition Initiative in Portland. We're seeking to get an initiative in place which would move Portland's uh, housing to uh, renewables within a span of about five years, we think we could get 80% of the housing targeting specifically low-income housing and um, vulnerable communities in Portland to have uh, renewable energy, solar energy, and weatherization within five years' time. So hopefully we can get it done. Great. <clears throat> um, what we wanted to do tonight is to talk a little bit about the peace discernment process. Um, this is a, and we're also gonna talk then about how we are moving forward in the peace discernment process after the General Assembly um, almost a year ago in Portland, Oregon, and how that is getting um, moved into the life of the larger church. So I just wanted to begin with a little bit of history about the peace discernment process. This started as an overture that came out of uh, many conversations that we were having in the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship. Um, it had been many years since peacemaking, um, a believer's calling had been published by the Presbyterian Church and we felt like that language needed some refreshing and we needed um, to think about peacemaking in, an, um, in a little bit of a different context and in a new time, especially a time of terrorism and the different questions that arise for us around nonviolence and nonviolent witness in the time that we are in. So this began as an overture coming out of National Capital <laughs> Presbyterian, Washington, DC to the General Assembly that was held in Minneapolis Minnesota in 2010. And the committee that received that overture actually perfected it and strengthened it and then um, began the process of a six year process of peace discernment uh, throughout the PCUSA. And those were six years of study that the denomination engaged in. There was, there were everything from small local conversations in people's living rooms to a few national conferences, to conversations that happened um, on military bases, to conversations that happened in um, church buildings. And there was a six person team that was commissioned from around the denomination to study. And then they were resourced by the peacemaking office of the Presbyterian Mission Agency. Um, they wrote a number of uh, white papers and those materials were then tested um, throughout the Presbyterian Church USA. There were votes um, uh, for the General Assembly that was in um, in Detroit in um, in Detroit, where we um, we had sort of straw votes on some of these. And then last summer in Portland, um, the five peacemaking affirmations were finally adopted at General Assembly. So these five affirmations that I'm gonna go through with you real quick were the final product of that six year uh, peacemaking discernment process. 
Um, the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship was really active all through the process in trying to encourage congregations and presbyteries to engage in the discernment process to move this along with the underlying goal of moving the denomination uh, in a direction um, more in alignment with um, our, our convictions, our commitment to a, a nonviolent witness uh, of Jesus Christ. So we, we think that this is, um, we think that these affirmations are good. They are not 100% exactly as we would have written them ourselves. There are some compromises within them, but these represent a substantial step forward for the denomination in terms of its commitments to peacemaking uh, in that uh, they move us from what had been a sort of de facto uh, just war theology into a much more active just peace uh, making theology where just war is listed just as one of several possible traditions that we might lean into uh, for, for determining uh, courses of action in response to violence in the world. So I'm just going to read them and uh, and move through what uh, what they are, so that you know these are how these are the basis for what we're going to spend most of the time tonight talking about, which is the process that we want congregations and communities to use uh, to reflect on their peacemaking work based on these affirmations. So the first affirmation is: We affirm that peacemaking is essential to our faith in God's reconciling work in Jesus Christ whose love and justice challenge evil and hatred, and whose call gives our church a mission to present alternatives to violence. And the second affirmation is, we confess that we have sinned by participating in acts of violence, both structural and physical, or by our failure to respond to acts and threats of violence with ministries of justice, healing, and reconciliation. The third uh, affirmation, we follow Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace and Reconciler, and reclaim the power of nonviolent love evident in his life and teaching, his healings and reversals of evil, his cross and resurrection. The fourth is a big one. It's two slides. It says, learning from nonviolent struggles and counting the costs of war, we draw upon the traditions of just war, Christian pacifism, and just peacemaking to cultivate moral imagination and discern God's redemptive work in history. We commit ourselves to studying and practicing nonviolent means of conflict resolution, nonviolent methods for social change, and nonviolent opposition to war. Even as we actively engage in a peace discernment process, we commit ourselves to continuing the long tradition of support by the Presbyterian Church USA for our sisters and brothers who serve in the United States military, veterans, and their families. We promise to support materially and socially veterans of war who suffer injury in body, mind, or spirit, even as we work toward the day when they will need fight to fight no more. And the last we place our faith, hope, and trust in God alone. We renounce violence as a means to further selfish national interests, to procure wealth, or to dominate others. We will practice boldly the things that make for peace and look for the day when they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So what has happened since General Assembly uh, last summer in Portland is um, that we, there was a meeting um, actually in the fall of, um, <clears throat> sorry, the spring of this year, spring of 2017, a meeting at the Stony Point Center, and this was convened by the peacemaking program of the Presbyterian Mission Agency. And folks were invited from all different parts of the church to talk about these affirmations and how we might live them out in practice in ministry and congregations and communities and Art Hunt, who's part of the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship, was at that meeting along with Emily Brewer, our director. And um, in a few minutes, we'll hear um, from Art about that meeting. There's also been two activist council meetings of the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship since then. And we have been talking about these affirmations at our activist council meetings and thinking through how we can live them out. And then there has already been some local testing of the affirmations um, and some folks have been using them already in worship and in the life of their congregations. One of the things that uh, came out from the uh, meeting at Stony Point were five ways of leading this, uh, these affirmations. And um, we began to play with this at the activist council meeting a few weeks ago in Chicago, and um, we developed them. Um, it was developed first from the meeting at Stony Point, 
as these um, ideas became a wheel so that they're interdependent and they build upon each other and they're also nonlinear. Um, they move in a circular fashion. And we thought it looked like a Pokeball from Pokemon, so that's why we're <laughs> calling it that. And so um, the areas are building community, direct action and advocacy, spiritual grounding and reflection, study and preparation, and then worship. And so that's the next piece we would like to talk about is how um, some ideas of ways that we might invite God's spirit to come alongside us and to help us as we live into these five areas. All right. So to be clear, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to come up with a tool that is a practical uh, tool that you can use in communities who want to take these five peacemaking affirmations and put them to work in the life of your community in some concrete, measurable way that you can, can get to begin to get some work out of them. So what our, uh, our, our vision is and what our thinking is, is that this, this Pokeball would become a, a, a sort of guideline for you to thinking about the different aspects of your community's life and how to live out these affirmations, different ways to be, be working on them. And to help you put the Pokeball into use, we've come up with some queries that we think you would, we would want you to start asking in your leadership team meetings, in your session meetings, in your presbytery meetings, uh, that, that you would use these to sort of deepen your conversation around each of these aspects. So the, this, we're going to go through some slides now that are these sets of queries that would help you sort of begin to drill down onto how do we practice this. So in the quadrant of the, the Pokeball that is uh, labeled building community um, it, it is part of, part of our piece work, we would want you to be asking these questions. We would want you to be asking, what is the state of our communal life? How often are we together? How deeply do we know and support one another? And one another. In other words, um, this is about just how how bonded, how intimate are we as a community? How how have we built those connections of fellowship and mutual love and understanding that will be the foundation on which we can do hard things, hard work like peacemaking? And then the second query there is how are we accountable? Number one to each other, and number two to vulnerable and marginalized persons with whom and for whom we are laboring toward a just peace. The question of accountability, the second query is intended to sort of focus the communal life around um, uh, how it is uh, in service toward the world, in service toward the beginning of peacemaking work. Uh, in our estimation, it, this, and this is a lesson we've learned from our accompaniment work in Colombia, is really partnership with um, vulnerable and marginalized persons who are the ones who guide us, who lead us into this peacemaking work. So these are the questions, these are the queries we'd want you to work on if you were wanting to ask questions about your communal life and how that connects and relates to peacemaking. In the next slide, we're talking about the quadrant that has to do with direct action and advocacy. So the first query here is, how are we putting our own bodies and resources on the line? How are we using our skills and gifts to work for concrete goals on the path toward a just peace? So this query really is about uh, sort of where the rubber hits the road. Like how are we actually taking material risks um, with ourselves, with our time, with our resources uh, toward uh, the goal of accomplishing uh, a just peace? And then the second query here is how are we responding to calls for action from vulnerable and marginalized persons in our efforts to achieve a just peace? Where, where, is our, uh, where, where are the concrete things we are doing in response to the requests that are made of us? Uh, how have we said yes to asks that have been made of us? The next slide is uh, regarding spiritual grounding and reflection. And the queries here uh, are, what are the guiding principles of our community? How are they being lived out? And what is necessary to help our community retain its focus? So out of um, our spiritual reflection regarding our own sense of call, our own sense of purpose and mission as a community, what are the uh, core principles, the guiding principles that we, that we are leaning on as a community? How are we doing and living those out? And how, uh, what, what might be necessary for us to retain our focus on those core principles? And then the second query is, what has the impact of our peacemaking work been on our community? Is there trauma or stress that needs to be addressed? Are there signs of spiritual maturity arising from our work? So the second question is a, is a reflection on action. This as I was writing these queries, this for me um, was uh, 
coming out of the model uh, in liberation work uh, of praxis where you, you, know, you act, reflect, act. Uh, that middle step of reflection is not disconnected from action. It's a reflection on the action we're doing. So this is about trying to get your spiritual grounding in your community to be intimately connected to the action that you're doing in the other part. Ha reflect upon the impact that your action has had um, on, on yourselves and on the people around you. The next is uh, the quadrant to do with study and preparation. And the queries here are, how is our community seeking to be better informed and prepared for the work of peacemaking? What educational resources are we using? What teachers are we listening to? So this is about, uh, you know, what, what books are we reading? What, um, what seminars or workshops are we attending? What, what voices are we listening to in uh, media and entertainment? And what members of our church and members of our community uh, are, are people who we respect and are listening to as teachers? And the second query is, how has our study and preparation impacted our plans and strategies for action? How are we growing in e efficacy and nuance due to what we've learned? So this is about trying to measure, again, the connection between our study and preparation and our action. How, how is our study actually informing uh, and growing our action? And then in the middle of the ball is worship. And worship could be thought of as its own quadrant, its own thing, but I think it's better thought of, and the reason why it's put in the middle of the ball is that it's really better thought of as something that seems to, that should flow in and out of all of the other areas uh, there. I often think that, uh, as particularly churches, when they get too much focus on worship, uh, become disconnected from everything else. And so I like to, instead of worship being treated as its own thing to ask more about how worship is informing and being connected with all these other things. So uh, the queries that we have here are how is worship practiced by this community in a way that builds up our capacity for peacemaking? How are themes of peacemaking expressed in our worship? So, you know, how is our worship itself expressing our core convictions and ideals regarding peace? Uh, and then the, the second there is what rituals have taken deep root in your community and how does worship rejuvenate us for difficult work? Uh, and this, um, I hope particularly the question about rituals goes beyond what we might do say Sunday morning in, at 10 o'clock and goes into the rituals that sort of weave their way through and undergird everything we do, all the times we spend together. How have we carved out, um, sacred ways of, of, of crafting space and time for each other um, when we're doing holy work, when we're doing hard uh, work, what that peacemaking often is. And so then the last slide here on the queries is um, identifying a starting place. So having looked at each of these five different areas on the Pokeball and asked these questions of our community and sort of to try to tease out some answers regarding where we are in our study and preparation, in our activism, in our worship, in our uh, spiritual grounding and reflection, and uh, and in the, the fifth, what's the fifth one? There, Shannon, we've got the Pokeball in front of you. Um, uh, yeah, so then the, having gone through these five areas of the Pokeball, the question then is, how, where to begin, how to, how to get started doing uh, this work. It's intentionally nonlinear. There's not one starting place. Uh, each community will figure out where they need to start. And so these are two, two queries that are designed to help you figure that out. Two different basic strategies for how you might choose a starting place. So the first query is, in which of the five areas of the Pokeball is our community strong? Can we build on our strength to get an early win, increase momentum, and encourage buy-in from other members of our community? The thought here is, is that one strategy for beginning to work on peacemaking work is to start where you already have some developed muscles, some developed skills, that you know you can put to use, um, and that helps the rest of you, that helps everyone get a, a sense of uh, capacity and energy for the work, which can be a, a great way to work. The other possible strategy, uh, which is in the second query, there is is in which of the five areas of the Pokeball does our community need work? Can we choose one to focus on at the beginning in order to strengthen our overall readiness for peacemaking? My uh, instinct uh, in work that I've done with previous communities is that sometimes um, there's some element of our communal life that is so uh, uh, underdeveloped 
we're not we're not deep enough in our relationships with each other or we're not uh, engaging regularly enough in meaningful ritual or we're not doing the formation the study and preparation that's needed or we're doing all those things just like good Presbyterians we do all of the internal preparation work and we never get out in the street and put our bodies on the line um, and so uh, sometimes there's one area that's so underdeveloped that it hinders the whole rest of all the rest of the work can only get so far if we haven't progressed in that area. So using this thought of where is our weakest point and how do we develop that would be another way to, to, to begin. The thought behind all of these queries is that having sort of as a community discerned where we are in these different aspects of our uh, communal life and peacemaking work together, identified where we're strong and where, we're, where we need more work, um, and where we're going to begin our work, that then the Pokeball becomes a sort of cyclical process of continuing to strengthen all the different areas, making sure that worship is weaved into each of the four different parts of the peacemaking work, and that you're, you're not letting any one area um, lie dormant and fallow and atrophy so long that it, it, it ceases to contribute to your communal life. Um, uh, nor are you focusing on one area so so intensely and so long that it comes to be the whole of your purpose, um, but that you sort of move through these um, and and continue to build on them uh, progressively. Great, thanks, Eric. <clears throat> one of the things I would share about this is that I I really want to underscore this area of the progression and going back. You might start with community and do things that strengthen your local community and then figure out ways that you are or are not connected to marginalized community. And then may, after a year or so, realize that you've really got that moving and move on to another area in the Pokeball. But then at the end, you might come back and say, our community is different, time has gone by. How can we go back and reassess this area? How can we go back and talk about this? And the other idea with this is that it's multi-generational. And so there are ways that um, you can, these are questions for adults, but you can also ask these questions for children or for youth in your congregations. I was just working with a group of fourth graders before we got on this webinar tonight, and we were looking at, at different pictures of communion. And one of the pictures that I showed them was a photo that I took at Fort Benning with the Peace Fellowship a few years ago where communion is served right in front of the gates. And another photo I showed them was from the Capitol Rotunda in Wisconsin uh, during the protests in 2011 there and communion being served. And I asked the kids, I said, why do you think that communion might be served at a protest? And one of the kids said, so that we can be more committed and so Jesus can be with us to give us strength, which is a perfect and wonderful answer. And it's, it, I think, just goes to show that you, these questions and these ideas really can be used from multiple different age groups, and we can talk about it in different ways. So I want to encourage that we use this with all different um, groups in our congregations. So what I'd like to do now is uh, Carl Horton, who's the associate for peacemaking for the denomination, wasn't able to be with us tonight, but um, Art Hunt is... Um, with us, and I'd like to um, I'd like to hear from Art a little bit, um, and hear what he is, um, what he has experienced being part of this uh, larger peace discernment process. So, Art, I'm going to unmute you and um, just interview you for a couple minutes, if that's okay. Can you hear me, okay, Art? Mm -hmm. Thank you. We can hear you. So Art, I wanted to ask you about the conversation that happened at Stony Point earlier this year and what some of the highlights were and what you took away from that gathering and what were some of the ideas that came up there um, in addition to those that we've been talking about on the call tonight. Um, so I think probably I could summarize that in, in maybe three parts. Um, so the first part is for a community that is interested in doing social justice work, what resources can they draw upon, both from the PCUSA and the work that the General Assembly has done and the work that the peacemaking program and all of its manifestations and, and, and ministries, uh, 
compassion, peace, and justice ministries uh, have done, and, and what work can they draw upon from the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship? Uh, so that's kind of the first place. The second place is, what should a community, um, how, how do we build communities uh, across congregations or across peacemaking groups within congregations so that the congregation can learn from the experiences of others so that they could uh, even uh, potentially cooperate uh, on actions within their region um, and have this sort of cross fertilization and um, cross inspiration, if you will, for the peacemaking efforts that they're doing. Um, and then the third is, how do we explain the difference between what the peacemaking program is all about and what the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship is all about? Mm -hmm. um, and it really has come down to my mind, and I've given this a lot of thought, uh, but it really has come down uh, to the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship being led by our activist council, our dedicated group of activists that are working on really significant justice issues, gun violence, justice in Palestine, ending the violence in Colombia, environmental justice, ending racism and white privilege, justice for immigrants, just amongst others. Um, and so while both groups encourage us to collaborate and, and encourage us to participate, um, the PPF is really the trailblazer for the, for the denomination. Um, we, we lead and participate in nonviolent actions and demonstrations. The activist council sets our priorities and energizes us, inspires uh, collectively the work of the PPF. Um, and we can get engaged in issues and activities that the denomination doesn't yet have a policy on, and working together as, as, as a Presbyterian Peace Fellowship and, and as a, a group of activists, the Activist Council, we can influence the, dom the denomination uh, to be more thoughtful, to be more inclusive, uh, to be more compassionate, and to take on issues that maybe have a degree of controversy that, uh, that the General Assembly has avoided in the past. So um, that's it's kind of the three areas that came out. One big thing that came out of our discussion at Stony Point is how much information, particularly on the PCUSA website, is, is, is there and, and how little of it is sort of um, would be the things that you would go to as the first step yeah. if you're interested in acting on an issue. So how do you separate the wheat from the chaff, if you will? So we had some discussions of of some improvements that could be made in the PCSA website. And, and in order to be able to identify those, those kind of core documents, core um, toolkits or um, explanations of issues, whichever that uh, churches, congregations, uh, local justice groups could, could use to get started to, to, uh, to, to understand an issue and then begin to, to formulate their plans for actions. So lots of words. I hope that covered everything that you wanted me to cover. That's great, Art. I really appreciate it, and it's helpful to hear some of what um, some of what went on at Stony Point. So thank you so much. You. So um, what I'd like to do now is um, open it up uh, to everyone. I'm going to um, take everyone off of mute and um, we're going to um, take any questions that anyone has about the queries, if we wanna go back and look at a particular one or take a look at the Pokeball and uh, talk about those. So any uh, questions that anyone has? Click there when you're done. And just to remember, everyone is unmuted now, so just try to miss any other background noise from where you are. I just, I just wanted to add, just in terms of the questions, one of the things that's really helpful is even before getting into this, it's just having a discussion about where the congregation is right now, what, what they think their aspirations are, their capacity is, their capabilities are, what are the local issues 
that, that they think are, are most compelling for them mm -hmm. in this conversation around um, how they're doing those, those, those five things. How, you know, yeah. we have a resource on the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship website. It's called It's in Action. And in that, it's, it's, a, it's, got, it's still centered uh, in worship, but it starts with education. It goes to a discernment based on what you've learned. It goes to action based on what you've discerned. And then goes to uh, reflection on the action and then continues that cycle around. So it's, it's kind of another way to look at the uh, audience that, that the Pokemon ball is also trying to get to. You know, I like the Pokemon because it adds that element of community. And, and really, in that community, being the community within the congregation. It's the community between the congregation and the marginalized uh, in their local area, but it's also the larger community of, of congregations that can work together. Great. So other thoughts or questions about the Pokeball, about the queries that anyone would like to ask or conversations people want to have about those? really interested in, in how people feel in terms of you know if you were to have this congregation have this conversation with your congregation where you might start and, and, and mm -hmm. where what in what areas would you think your congregation's um, real strengths are yes so what I'm going to do here is just uh, put the pokeball back up for a minute so we can really take a look at that again I think uh, um, one thing that was helpful to me uh, is uh, that w as we were talking about this in the executive committee um, in Chicago, we began talking about examples of using this in our own working groups in PPF. Um, uh, so for example, uh, Jessie Light, who's on the call, maybe she wants to say a little bit about, she had some thoughts about how she might use this with the Middle East committee. And uh, I had some thoughts about how maybe we might apply this using this with our committee on uh, creation justice, and looking at like within that community, what areas on the on the Pokeball are we strong at and are we weak at, and what could we use some development? And then now that we've developed these queries, what I would do is go down and sit sit with that committee and say, okay, this is a a quadrant we've identified that we need some work on. So let's sit with these queries and ask these questions of ourselves to see if we can't figure out how to begin developing our work in this area a little bit more. Um, like we're doing on the uh, Creation Justice Committee, we're doing a fair amount of direct action and advocacy, but we haven't really done a lot in terms of uh, community building within our own group, trying to, you know, so how would we do that? Getting to know one another a little bit better and building those bonds, which are the thing that keep you going when the work is hard. We also talked at the activist uh, council meeting and the executive committee meeting about, um, we had a long extended conversation about the grief that many of us feel over the situation in Syria and how um, helpless so many of us feel and um, really that there's nothing, we feel almost hopeless to some degree that we are just so unable to find anything substantial to wrap our hands around and to do and ways to engage in the situation in Syria. And so we were talking about um, what would we have done different as peacemakers and those that are committed to the gospel of nonviolence 10 years ago about Syria if we knew where we would be today and what would be the actions we would take that would be different. And so one of the questions we began to interrogate amongst ourselves was the question of what are some of the things that we see looming that will be as heartbreaking to us 10 years from now that we did not fully engage and fully put our best selves into as peacemakers and we somehow didn't uh, take us seriously perhaps 
as we needed to. And one of the, the areas we began talking about was ecological uh, destruction, the violence that is being done to God's creation and the calling on our lives to be nonviolent towards the creation, but also mm -hmm. to be part of the healing and the restoring of creation. And so using this Pokeball as a, again, as a tool to think about what are the things that are breaking our hearts? What are the things that are breaking God's heart? What are the things that seem insurmountable or intractable that we just can't get to? And thinking about how do we engage ourselves, not just in a straight linear way towards these things, but again, in a more circular fashion, but hopefully a more holistic fashion. And how do we live these out and use these queries to help us really get uh, to the root of our calling and what we're needing to be and what we're needing to do. So that's another way that we began to talk about this Pokeball and talk about these queries uh, together. I see that we have Margie, uh, Marjorie Rossi on from the gun violence group in the Peace Fellowship. Um, and um, I also know that Leslie Vogel is on. Leslie is an international um, mission co-worker in Guatemala. I'd be curious to hear as you just think about these tonight with those two different areas that, of work, um, how you think this may or may not be useful in your context. Uh, Shannon, I'd be happy to answer that. This is Marjorie. Great. Um, I actually was sitting here thinking about the building community piece and how we might do that uh, within the Peace Fellowship uh, gun violence group, um, given that we're spread across the country. Um, and we had also talked about at the Activist Council uh, the difficulty of um, direct action. Um, there's a lot of focus on advocacy and particularly legislative advocacy, uh, which puts us into a difficult situation for several reasons, one of which is the complete unwillingness of our legislators to uh, move on anything at all around gun violence, uh, and people lose hope very quickly and get frustrated about uh, advocacy work. So it tends to um, burn people out pretty quickly. And the other reason is that it puts us into the position of um, doing political work as people of faith when what we are trying to do is um, address gun violence as a theological, pastoral, spiritual issue and try to take it out of the realm of political rhetoric and uh, just, you know, div divisiveness. Mm -hmm. So uh, so when we land there, it's a natural place for people to land, um, but it's a frustrating place for people to land. Mm -hmm. And so we, talked, we have talked about uh, the need to come up with creative direct action, but not really knowing what that might look like. Um, so it, you know, so I'm sitting here so, sort of mulling over these various uh, sections of the of the ball uh, and how we might integrate them uh, into our work the building community is the piece that most has my attention at the moment I don't really have any answers but I recognize that that is uh, that is important um, and difficult when we're spread across right. the country right absolutely yeah and that's a really helpful way of beginning to think through the wheel and thinking through the ways that it might might work in your particular context or area of work in ministry. So other questions we can address tonight, ideas? Or maybe you wanna unmute Leslie for a second, ask her if she's got- yeah, Leslie, I'll unmute you. Uh, I think, did I just unmute you, Leslie? Uh, yeah, actually I unmuted myself. Oh, I had muted myself because of background noise. <laughs> You're able um, to we can hear you. That's great. Uh, I I don't I don't know if I'm ready to give thoughts yet. I'm just learning this stuff. So um, I was especially trying to envision in what context I could put 
these uh, concepts into action or into practice uh, here in Guatemala because it's not like there's a Presbyterian congregation that's addressing or engaging in these things. So, um, so I've just been trying to sort through in my head with whom I might take some first steps mm -hmm. to do that. I mean, I do some of these things individually, personally, but, but trying to do them with other people, you know, what would be the community that I could choose? So that I'm more asking myself questions than having any wisdom to share with the rest of you right now. Mm. You know, it makes me think back, Leslie, to the time we were together um, on the women's retreat, uh, mm -hmm. addressing issues of domestic violence um, mm -hmm. and talking about them a couple summers ago. And how, if I think through that retreat with the Pokeball here, um, we really did cycle through all these pieces, but we weren't thinking about it in that way at the time. Mm -hmm. that the, we attended a retreat for everyone else that was um, an overnight retreat for a few nights, bringing women um, through the, the women's groups um, in the churches to come and to talk about the effects of domestic violence on our lives and um, what happens um, with that area, with that issue of close familial violence. And there was a lot of community building that happened, games that we played, ways that we got to know each other. Um, there wasn't any real direct action but people were learning how to advocate for themselves. Um, mm -hmm. We did a lot of study, there was spiritual grounding and we had worship. So those pieces were integrated into that retreat setting. Um, and mm -hmm. that was just a one time coming together of a group. But I did think that one of the most interesting pieces for me at that event was, um, I'm forgetting his name, who does a lot of the driving uh, for Sadepka. Oh, Freddie. Mm -hmm. Yeah spoke he was um very emotional at one point and we were speaking with him and he was remembering as a man um some domestic violence that had happened in his home towards his mother and yeah. about his daughter and his wife and how he wanted to be very different and mm -hmm. so it was it was not a direct action as we might think of it of oh we're going to do a march or um something of that of that sort, but he was really thinking about that direct action um, individually in his own life and how transformative that could be um, as mm -hmm. he really decided to live in a very different way than perhaps he had been cultured or raised um, expectations of, you know, gender identity and maleness for him growing up. So even this Pokeball could be used in something like that if you're doing a peacemaking retreat. That's certainly, in my yeah. mind, peacemaking retreat that we shared. Yeah. Together. Thank you. I like how your brain works. <laughs> um, actually, the other thing I was thinking about a little, so I'll share briefly, yeah. is that um, you're, some of you are aware that we're organizing with Carl Horton um, uh, peacemaking and climate justice and faith travel seminar, travel study seminar for um, August. And uh, there will be folks coming here to Guatemala first and then also um, to Costa Rica where Carla Cole, another mission coworker, will, will receive the group. And we'll be looking primarily at mining issues here in Guatemala and at um, water issues in Costa Rica. But in the context of all that, meeting with communities of faith that are addressing these kinds of issues. Um, so uh, as I prepare for a webinar, or not webinar, but a, a Skype call with, uh, with Carl and Carla and Rebecca Barnes tomorrow, uh, I'm, I'm looking at this wheel and thinking about how we can shape different aspects of, of the group time uh, in order to incorporate some of this process. So this is really helpful in thinking about that in particular. <clears throat> That's great. Thank you, Leslie. We're really glad you're here. Thanks for pulling me in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so glad. So I see we're getting close to time. I think we have time to talk about maybe one more idea from another community or something else uh, someone would like to bring up. Shana, this is Emily. Um, I was just thinking about, I've, I've been with um, Marta Munoz y, and Diego Iwita today from the Colombian Presbyterian Church, and we went to the United Nations and then to the Presbyterian meeting here in New York. So I got to spend most of the day with them, which was just um, 
always really a privilege. And so I was listening to them in these UN meetings talking about the peace process in Colombia and the church's role. Mm. And I was just struck again by how um, sure they are of their identity as peacemakers and Christians. And so I almost would, you know, I wish that I could have figured out a way to, to have them on the call with us tonight, because I would love to be in conversation more with them about, about this, because that um, I think probably most of you all know on this call that the um, Presbyterian Church of Columbia has taken a, a really strong stance in nonviolence. Um, and they're, they're politically active, but they're very clear that they um, are not politicians, that they are first and foremost the church. They're not aligned with any particular political party. Um, and so I would just love to, to have some more conversation with them about what this mm -hmm. looks like yeah. in their context. And um, yeah, just learn some more from them, particularly about how they have taken you know, very specific issues. Like they have taken education and really just like taken um, one issue. They've seen a need in their local communities um, for kids to be educated well and they have just committed themselves to it and um and then that dedication and commitment has led to other issues and um things like that so yeah it, i'm just i've just been reflecting um more and more on how lucky we are to have that relationship with them because they're such a powerful model for us thanks emily well, Emily, you couldn't have planned it better into a segue for the very end of this webinar, which is uh, to talk about our next webinars, and our next one is on Columbia. Um, so maybe this is uh, something we might think about for the next webinar is asking them some of these specific questions and going back and looking at the Pokeball wheel again, um, but through that lens, that might be really uh, great to do. Um, we also have a webinar um, in August, uh, hearing from the Israel-Palestine delegation in October, getting ready for General Assembly a year from now, and then one just before Advent on resistance in Advent, and um, also information about the Activist Council, and our next Activist Council meeting will be uh, September 28th through the 30th. And so Eric is going uh, to close us with prayer. Hey, I'm Eric Garbison. Hi, my name is Lauren Newby. My name is Edward Green. All right, let us, uh, let us go ahead and close this time in prayer. So grateful that you all took this time to spend with us uh, here tonight. This will be, um, it's, it's recorded. This will be going up on the YouTube channel that uh, Presbyterian Peace Fellowship maintains. So if you wanna refer to it in the future or share it with anyone else who wasn't able to be with us tonight, you can do that as well. Uh, we'll have that link up in just a couple days. Let us pray. God of peace, who is our ground and the beginning and the middle and the end of our being, we ask that you would ground us now spiritually in this work of peacemaking, that you would ground our identities uh, in the concept of being peacemakers. May we strive for that and live that on a daily basis. May we seek to grow uh, through study and through listening to wise teachers, through reflecting on those that have been further along the path than us and the experience and wisdom that they have to offer us. May we continue to grow closer to one another in community. May we build those bonds of love and fellowship, which are the nature that will get us through uh, hard times. They are the things that will help us to endure when uh, there are no easy answers, uh, when, it, when it does not seem there are quick solutions, and when it seems uh, that violence and dominance and acquisition and greed are rising in our world. And then we ask that you would propel us out into the world with courage, putting our own bodies, putting our resources, putting our talents, putting our time on the line, risking uh, our very selves for the sake of your kingdom, knowing that in such risk, uh, we draw close to your spirit, are enveloped in your love, and ultimately are an example. We ask that you would help us to live such a life of peacemaking and to go out into the world in love and joy and peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you everyone for being on the call. And um, we look forward to um, being with you on our next webinar. And thank you for spending part of your evening 
with all of us and the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day and evening. And join us for the next few webinars. They're going to be great. Yes. Thank you.